him speak to us. Worship him. Worship him. Please give him glory. Give him honor. Give him adoration. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him for your spiritual journey. Thank him for your life. Thank him for your family. Thank him for all the progress that you have been making. Thank him for everything that he's going to do in our midst even today. Go ahead and worship him. Go ahead and worship him. Go ahead and worship him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Oh, I will not be silent. And I will always worship you as long as I am living, as long as I tonight we thank you again thank you for what you have said to say to us lord don't spare words with us tonight speak to us change our lives let us experience a shift in our walk with you let us experience a shift in understanding thank you for your presence that is here with us in jesus mighty name we have prayed Please take your seat in God's presence. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Thank you so much for the privilege to be with us tonight. I thank all the leadership, everyone who is present here. I'm hearing a sound in my spirit. But this is the only moment when God walks in on us. Every case is on the lion and the lamb. Do we know the song? Okay, we don't know the song. This is only moment when God walks in on us. Every gaze is on the lion and the lamb. For when the glory comes, there will be no much to say. Oh. When the glory comes, there'll be no more to say. Oh, again, let's take that when the glory comes. 
For when the glory comes, there'll be no much to say. Oh, oh, oh. For when the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh, 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 one more time. When the glory comes. For when the glory comes, there'll be no much to say. Oh, oh, oh. oh when the glory comes, there'll be no much to say. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Tonight, I'll be speaking to you briefly on a revival to remember. A revival to remember. One of the very important things that every man who is working with God must know is that God works with times and seasons even though he's not controlled by it. So that in every season, in every time, there are emphases of God. What makes us to maximize opportunities and maximize life is the ability to know what God is doing per time. To know what God is saying per time, otherwise you will be distracted by many activities and not be able to pick that which God is doing in that season. You see, if anybody entered into Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Jesus Christ when he was going to be born, everyone is going to think that what was happening on that day was a census. People traveled from their hometown to the city. People left what they are doing to concentrate on the census. Businesses were vibrant because an hotel business, for example, the Bible said every inn, every hotel was filled up. So for the business owner who owns the hotel, is going to be thinking that this is a season of boom. For those who were medical practitioners, there was absolutely no time. You see the nurses running, elders scattered, the doctors entering into surgery, because as far as they are concerned, this is a season of boom. But in heaven, everything that was happening on that day had nothing to do with census. Because the entire strategy was to ensure that a manger is free. So that Jesus will be born. So while everybody is thinking that the activity is the census, where was the main thing happening? Where nobody was looking at. That is how distracted our generation is. We are looking at what God is not saying. And many times, only a few people know the emphasis of God per season and per time. And that is how many people are able to accurately position themselves to what God is doing. And they are able to maximize it for their life, their calling, their purpose, and their destiny. I want you to know today that revival has been the emphasis of God for a while. And in every time that God brings up this matter, it is a clear indication that the subject of revival and what God wants to do with revival has still not been accomplished. I can assure you that God is doing many great things. Today, I was watching a service in Dunamis, and I couldn't believe, I don't know what led me there. And I couldn't believe that there was still a church like that around. Because what I am used to, sadly, is that miracles only happen in miracle services. That's what 
the general church is used to, that it has to be called a miracle service for a miracle to happen. But in Dunamis today, I realized that the sermon can be love, but a deaf person can still hear. Because that's the topic of today, to love one another. How many of you, okay, you don't attend Dunamis. But that's the topic that Dr. Paul preached today. So I can assure you that God is doing mighty things everywhere. But for him to still be talking about revival, it means that that's which he wants to do. And that's which he wants to achieve by revival has still not been accomplished. Because you won't keep repeating a subject if people have passed it. With passing means that there will be new emphasis, there will be new topics. God is taking us back to this because we have still not checked certain boxes. And I will try my best tonight in the next 30 minutes. To help you to see what God has helped me to see from the pages of the scriptures. And as it relates to this meeting that he has placed on my mind. I'll be very brief. So I want you to follow me very quickly. All I'm going to do at the end of tonight is to be able to raise a prayer point. That's my target. And that when we begin to pray that prayer... For just about seven minutes, God will help us to be able to pray so well that he will use whatsoever we ask today to begin something in our lives. As a nation, as a body of Christ, and in our personal lives in the name of Jesus. Oh, I can't hear your amen. Let your amen be loud and clear. Let's take one scripture and then I'll begin my journey. Psalm chapter 85 verse 6. It's just a simple Bible study. Psalm 85 verse 6. Will you not revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. What man is actually living at the moment was not the ultimate plan of God. Because the reality of the matter is that when we begin to talk about revival, we're talking about trying to bring someone who has lost consciousness, position, placement, back to place. So if a man has not lost consciousness, we won't be asking him to be revived. If a man has not lost his place, we won't be talking about revival. If a man has not lost position, we will not be talking about revival. The only reason why we are talking about revival today is because man lost his place. But you see, many times the average man finds it difficult to understand what man has lost. Because even though man has lost his place in God and man has lost all that God intended that that man should be. And I'm talking about Adam. The Adamic fall. I want you to look at the world today and see that despite the fall, see what man has achieved. Despite the fall of man, what we describe as less of the original plan of God, man can still fly an heavy object over the sea and it is not falling. And that is a falling man. Man can still divide a whole human being into pieces, fix certain things in his body, and sew him back, and that man will be living. And that is a fallen man. The fallen man can leave the realms of this earth and still stay in space. And stay there for weeks, for months, and then come back. And it looks as if nothing unusual had happened. And guess what? That is a fallen man. If that is the fallen man, then what is the description of the kind of man God had in mind? What exactly could we have achieved if we didn't fall? I think it's eating in that scripture that says, eyes have not even seen. Hears have not heard. Neither has it come into the mind of men. In the day that man enters into fullness like Jesus Christ, we will really do the impossible law. Because the man that you are seeing doing wonders is not even at the peak. 
of what God thought it would be. So revival came into the equation because man fell. Sin was the reason why we now need a revival. And every time sin enters into any system, a revival is needed. The church of God is growing because it's a prophetic word of God. He said, I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail. Meaning that God was saying that he would ensure that there is growth. Because anything you are building does not remain small. And there is something synonymous with growth. It is that as a thing begins to grow and it begins to expand, something happens to it immediately. It is open to more corruption. When you look at a little baby in the womb, there are very few things that can kill the child in the womb. It has to take whatever happens to the mother to touch the seed in the womb. But you see, the moment you give birth to that child, the element of destruction increases. It can die of cold now. It can die of infection now. It can die of every kind of death. Becomes exposed to the child. Why? <laughs> because it's growing. That's the same thing that happens as God's body grows. If the church continues to grow, it cannot be free from the invasion of corruption that the enemy will try to put in. As the people of God continue to expand, the more you grow in number, the more you are open to corruption. That is why different kind of people are entering into our midst and we cannot control it because it is synonymous with growth. Except you don't want growth. As anything grows, you will begin to contend against corruption. What I'm doing is I'm trying to give you a foundation as to why we need revival. Because as things are getting better, you must not forget that the enemy continues to sow seeds in every area to ensure that as much as the thing is still alive, it's not as strong as it can be. So that everything that the devil cannot destroy, his strategy is to dilute. As soon as you see a thing that the devil cannot destroy, he ensures that the potency of that thing is diluted. And everything that he cannot stop, everything he cannot hinder, he weakens. What we see around is not the fullness it is only by revival that we will bring God the joy that he needs. And that's what we see in the prayer of the psalmist. Will you not revive us again? Not just so that we will rejoice, so that there will be a kind of joy that God himself will have. It is only for a revived people that God can rejoice. I will mention to you two things that I want you to bear at the back of your mind and then I will take you through an history and then talk about somebody in scripture and then I will close. Number one. One of the signs of revival is that it is the impartation that produces anointed teachers Anointed hearers and anointed doers. The proof of revival is an impartation of anointed teachers, anointed hearers, and anointed doers. Once the revival begins, the first place is going to take place is from the altar of God, such that what is being taught will be what God wants to be said. Men will not only speak because they have been assigned to speak. They will be able to download right from the throne of God and be able to speak a word in season to him that is weary and cause a revival in their hearts. The first place revival takes place is upon the priest life that speaks. So when God orchestrates a revival, the first person that feels the impact of that revival is the teacher's. God begins to raise men who can speak his mind. That's the first place that the work of God will begin. Because the world that we live in lacks people who speak accurate truth. And that is why lies are abounding. 
There are many lies around. And the sign that revival has begun is that again truth will be coming from the altar of God. And the second work is that it will come upon the hearers so that they will be anointed to hear accurately. They will hear out of order. They will hear to do. Many people hear to live. They hear, but they never do what they have heard. They only hear, and then when they leave that auditorium, they go into whatever they were doing before. But the purpose of revival is that you will be so convicted that when you hear the voice of God, it will convict you to become an anointed doer. It is not enough to hear the word of God. The question is, what do we do with what we have heard? What is that message that we want to preach to the 21st century church? What is that mystery that we want to bring about again that you think that we don't know? But you see, what we have as abundance in the body of Christ today are those who hear and who don't do. As a matter of fact, I have met men who teach and don't do. I, I have said it many times that you see, if every minister of God who waits on God or who stumbles upon a good message should listen to what he teaches, he will realize that the sermon was not for the people. But God knows that the only opportunity he has to speak to you was going to be when you are told you are going to preach. So take time to listen to your message because God was speaking to you. You will find men who preach powerful sermon who have not listened to what they said. Who don't follow what God is saying to them because they thought the message was for the people and they did not know that the message was for them. Revival begins when the teachers become anointed to speak God's word. When the listeners become anointed to hear what God is saying in season and will not misinterpret it. And when they become anointed to live by the word, the truth of the matter is that we are a generation that looks too much like the world that we are sent to save. How can you change those who you look like? Every time you look like what you have been sent to change, you cannot command change because the world is waiting. And let me tell you, the world is waiting patiently for the manifestation of the sons of God. They will not take a man with error. They will wait. So if you do not have the stature of a man who has had what God wants you to live by, and you live by those words, they will know that you are not the one, and they will move on. So revival begins first in the house of God. When the minister can take the word of God and speak what God is saying. Many of the activities of the church has become a ritual. It has lost many of its potencies. When the structure of the church was created, there were purposes for those things. I always tell people, you see, it's not a mistake that the choir sings before the pastor. There was a structure that they found. That it was possible that when people begin to offer an incense of worship to God, a presence can come that can silence the preacher. Such that if he came with a sermon, he won't be able to preach what he thought was the sermon because God will enter into his lips. There was a reason why they did it like that. Offering time was not designed to be a time of contribution. There was a purpose. It's for men to understand that it is possible to offer beyond just your lip service for something that cost you to God. But unfortunately, many of those things have lost its potency because it has become ritualistic. Anointing must come back on it again. So that in the day you hold the mic as a singer, you know that you are as important as the man who is going to give the sermon because you are ushering something beyond just a nice voice to the people of God. When that begins to happen again, you will be shocked what will begin to happen in our lives. So the first thing revival causes is that it produces anointed teachers, anointed hearers, and anointed doers. Number two, every revival begins in God, continues in God, and ends with him. So that every single time a man puts his name on what God began, God takes his name off it. Revival is not tied to any man. 
One reason why we have to recycle revival in our days is because men always want to associate a man towards the move of God. Listen carefully to me. If God uses you for anything, never forget that God is using you. The day you put your name on what God is doing, he will take out his name. The day you associate any man, and that is why many revivals, as great as they were, the moment men entered it, they died. The Azusa Street Revival, that was the move of what we define as the free flow of speaking in tongues today, began as a group of people who were praying. They began to pray. Long hours. Had no leader. And so as they were praying, just about 50 of them, they increased to 100. And when prayers would be going on, people stumbled into the house of prayer. And then sick, they became old. So they would tell their friend, I went to pray there, my life changed. They had no timeline to the prayer. Because what started out as, let's seek God, was increasing from one day to two weeks, to three weeks, to four weeks, to one month, to two months. And it was growing like that. And strange things were happening. One day, a woman had a fight with her husband and he cut off her hair. She came into the meeting with a, the hairs almost dropping. Entered into the meeting. Somebody just laid hands on her. Hair came back. And there was no man of God to take the glory. But very soon, which is the behavior of men, when things begin to happen, we try to tie it to a man. We try to make a man the center of attention. We take our eyes off the reality of the one that is the author and the finisher, and we say, oh, that's the man in charge. And the moment that began to happen, <laughs> natural separation began to take place, and ultimately he died. God takes his name away from anything that a man puts his name. Don't put your name where God has put his name. Listen to me. God is not always afraid of taking all the glory. And he doesn't also mind taking all the shame. So don't put your name to accept glory or shame. Let God be the ultimate person who is the author of revival. The one in the revival and the ending of every revival. There was an intention of God, especially for the Nigerian church. And I hope that we understand that our presence here today is by prophecy. How many of you know that? Okay. There was an intention of God, especially for the Nigerian church. Many of these prophecies are available, still present. As a matter of fact, there was a prophecy that 100 years after the Azusa Street, God was going to do something in Africa and in Nigeria specifically that would be similar to that movement. We saw a part of it, but we never experienced the fullness of it. We saw the rise of a prayer movement to mark the 100 years of the Azusa Street Revival. But we didn't enter into the fullness of it. When God began to move, and was going to bring about the accomplishment of that which he has spoken, God began to move with our fathers. But many of them, because of illiteracy, could not understand all that God was doing. The white men came into Africa, preached the gospel, but they couldn't receive all of it. So many of them, by vehicle of the revelation that they saw, they made a lot out of God that he was not. There were men who saw angels, and because that was the encounters that they saw, their emphasis became angels. There were some that because some instruction came as a result of their location, very close to the sea, very close to a river, their emphasis became these things. All of these things, God still used it to bring about many conversions. God still used it to deliver and cause deliverance in many cities, but it was still ultimately not the intention of God for the African church. I want you to take time as a believer to dive into history so that you can know the prophecy that lies upon this country and how you play a part, either now or in the future, of what God intends to do. Because if you don't know, you won't understand though, there's prophecy on this nation. 
And a generation must begin to learn how to press into it. I'm burdened more now than I was burdened before because I've realized that now I'm no longer as young as I used to be. And if you miss the timing and what God intends that you do in that season, you will only realize that at the end of the day you lived, you gave birth to children and you died and that was just it. Sit down with parents and then you will realize that many of them knew this prophecy. And they are shocked that time has gone. This is how time flies, oh, like this. And 20 years will come and you will realize that every energy you had to expend upon God has gone. Because now you are bothered about many things. Let me continue my story. So when God realized that there was no way he could use this man for all that he wanted to do, God began to seek a new breed. A new breed that was going to be uncorrupted. Uncorrupted, why? The foundation of our great grandfathers now, or grandfathers, and I'm talking about the likes of Orimolade, the Babalolas, the popular ones that we know, had a foundation of idolatry. That is why the typical activity of some of these people, even when they want to administer the help of the Holy Spirit, it will almost look as if, ah, is this jazz or the real thing? And so when God realized that some of these things were going to ultimately corrupt his move, God began to seek a new breed. A new breed that was uncorrupted, that has not been defiled in any way. And God realized that the only way he can find a new breed is if he gets them young. It is only someone that is just rising, that has not seen many of the affairs of life. And God knew the best way to catch them. Where he designed that he was going to catch them, especially in Nigeria was going to be the university campuses. So what God did was when he saw the corruption ahead, that if these people continue, there will be many questions that these men cannot answer. Let me start to begin to groom a new generation. So God, by the mystery of transition, began to invade our university campuses. And every move of God that we can tie and know now and tied to the present move of God in Nigeria is traceable to the university campus. Every father of faith that you know, look back at their history, they found God in the university. That was where their burning passion became or started to grow. That was where God began to build something within them. Capacity, life, strength of prayer, wisdom, knowledge, the ability to study scriptures, the interpretation, it began in the university campus. And they began to grow like that until they became now what they have become. But unfortunately, the system of God for rescuing a generation, which is to catch them young, the enemy has also found that strategy. Because you see, when Jesus wants to ride into Jerusalem, there is a kind of coat he began to look for. He was looking for a coat that nobody has ridden on. Somebody who has no understanding, something new and fresh. But unfortunately, the university system has been corrupted. The devil, I said it as I was teaching, that everything that the enemy cannot destroy, what does he do to it? He would dilute it. So the devil did not destroy the movement of God in the church. Or in the schools rather. What he did was very simple. He introduced what looks like God. But it's not God. So what he introduced to dilute the move of God in the university campuses was denomination. So when he introduced denomination into what entered into the, uni or the university campus... Everybody started to divide. Because the proof of revival, number three, is unity. So immediately, the advocacy in message became my church. The advocacy in trying to ensure that the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of God was no longer 
about God taking the glory, but about my denomination excelling. So everybody began to have their style, their method, their doctrines, their behavior, their will, their way. And so two sets of people found it difficult to come together to be able to achieve anything major. But you notice something within this. Every single time they come together, all of a sudden, there is always a greater revival than when one person does it. Everything is to direct us back to the original plan of God. That the intention of God is still these people, but there is a pollution. But yet, people are still blinded towards what God is doing. I'm going on a journey. And I will soon arrive there. The intention of God is for a united body. Bodies are not separated. But the devil knows that your potency drops every single time you are divided. So when denomination entered into the university campuses, we now had so many people who are leaders of different sets of people. And by division, the enemy began to penetrate and then weakened our potency. Today is extremely difficult to know the difference between Muslims. Do you know that there are 70 different denominations in Islam? Can you tell one apart from the other? Now, no, if you are not inside, you can't know which one is one. But you see, if I bring a pagan here, by looking at you, you can tell that this one, this one does not attend this church. Because our difference is too clear. But the design of Jesus was that while he was walking with his disciples, it was even impossible for you to know which one was the Lord. As this journey continued, not only did denomination enter into the schools, the issue of leadership entered whereby people became self-centered and people were seeking position and status and he increased to the level whereby ultimately sin ultimately entered into our fellowships and our meetings. Everything that was the reality of God began to vanish and the potency of God's power was weakened on the campus. But here is what I've still realized. God has still not changed the strategy of looking for a new breed because it's still from that new breed that there will be a revival to remember. And so what this is what God is doing. God is jumping generations. And what he wanted to do with the youths is jump into the teenagers. Because that's the only place that he can still get unity. And let me warn a generation that if God does not find teenagers, he's still going to jump to the children. Because out of the mouth of babes and suckling, he has still ordained strength. All that what God is looking for, that is his intention, is is looking for a vessel that he can sit upon. Because as long as God can find one whose heart is united with him, and he can find partners, he can win any generation for himself. And that takes me to the conclusion of what I have to say to you today. And it's about a man called Samuel. Because through him, God did something in Israel. That was their own kind of revival. Israel was God's firstborn. Israel was God's precious nation. Among all nations of the earth. God said Israel is my firstborn. So God's intention was clear about these people. But unfortunately, Israel had one attitude that never changed. God referred to it as prostitution. And that is the state of the church of God. A church that will for one day be with God, but by tomorrow is of God. A body that seeks God only for what we will get. Never thinking about what God will get. Our prayer movements are Based upon need. Many do you, you, it's difficult to find a set of people who all they are asking for is God. That is why there is so much glory in being young. Because you don't have many problems being young. 
I was pastoring a place once where they didn't like my sermons. And they didn't like my sermons because there was no time whereby I ever spoke about needs. Everything I spoke about was hunger. Everything I spoke about was prayer. Everything I spoke about was a return of glory. Because as far as I was concerned, there was no glory there. So the adults didn't like it because they had school fees to pay. They had health issues that they wanted us to pray about. And here comes this boy who every time he's looking at the congregation, the only thing he's telling them is, get hungry again. But you know the shocking thing in that congregation? Seated there were one-time prayer coordinators. I know a particular lady when she was in Lautec. As a matter of fact, before she got married, the reason why she came to that church was because there was a flaming fire in her that she had gone through Abuja looking for a church that will at least allow that fire to continue. She didn't find. And then she stumbled on this place and said, ah, is this this denomination church? I've never seen this before. So when she entered, how she came was because she was looking for somebody to fan the flame until she stayed in that church. And within three years, she had two children. And after two children, I sit left the front to be sitting at the back and gisting. I've seen people decline, you know. What I'm saying is that it is not only the body of Christ that needs revival. Men sometimes need revival. That is why sometimes I challenge young people. Before the affairs of life begin to choke you, build a foundation that will last in God. That 30 years from now, you, you, you are still losing your voice in prayer. Because it is very easy to become excited with the affairs of life that you lose sight on realities. Because let me tell you, any other thing that you get that is not God, out of this space does not matter. Everything you gather here, you live here. <laughs> but there is something that you take there. He is God himself. So in the days of Israel, Jesus, or rather God, was their inheritance. He, he didn't give them things. He gave them himself. So Israel had God as an inheritance. Nations heard of this reality of God and they trembled as a result of this reality. They were afraid of Israel. We're about to pray now. And so, the only thing that Israel could boast of was God. It was God. Their confidence was God. Their life was God. Because they were no ordinary people. They were people with covenants. And I'm looking here and I'm seeing people who there's covenant over your life. Because you see, God does not create a man without an intention. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let him have dominion. It means there was a purpose at the heart of God before God created him. God first has a thought before he makes you. What you should be searching for is what was captured in your thought at creation. When you said, ah, let us make Fumi in our own image and after our likeness so that he will enter into your state and he will redefine the political system. There was something captured in his mind. So when God was making Israel and calling Israel his nation, many things were at the back of his mind. He wanted to make a people that looks like his bride. He wanted to show the world what it means that I can love. And so he did not leave them without a covenant. Israel got into Egypt and by the hand of God, God rescues them out of Egypt. People who entered into a land of slavery, they did not even go through the orders of fighting a battle in their life because God fought for them. That, that's what it means to be a man of covenant. Israel did not have to make swords. Do you know what it means to be a military system and you have never imported guns? How Israel goes to battle is with the ark of God. When the Bible was describing the nature of their warfare, they said only the king had a sword and it was for ceremonial purposes. When David was going to fight Goliath, the reason why he did not have a sword is because they don't use swords to fight in Israel. Their weapon is God. 
But that nation knew nothing else but prostitution. It's funny how God will be so merciful upon a man's life. And yet he will look at that mercy and still throw it back on his face. That's what the Nigerian church looks like. That in the face of everything that we have gone through, God has still been merciful upon us. But you see, the corruption in the house of God is wild. The sin that people do in the house of God, you will be afraid. People stand on the altar of God. And what they are saying is altar lies. Ah, you'll be shocked at those who come on the altar of God and leave the altar of God and go back into iniquity. No atom of guilt. Those are people who mock the grace of God. That was what Israel was. Things had reached his height when he came into the days of Eli. And the Bible told us, Eli had worked with God because his name, in other words, means God. But unfortunately, there was an inability to disciple his son to walk in his ways. So his sons began to come and they began to defile the sacrifices of God. You see, God will not joke with anything. But when a man begins to touch his sacrifice, he responds. That was the difference between the son of Eli and the son of Samuel. The children of Samuel were perverting justice. So they were taking bribes. But the children of Eli, they will look at the sacrifice and look at the one that suits them and take it. They will sleep with women in front of the church temple. At least if you are doing something bad, do it where nobody will know. How can you be disgraced to the name of God and everybody knows that that's what you are doing and yet you call yourself a priest? God had reached a point of vexation. God had reached a point whereby he couldn't take it again. And the next thing he had to do was to ensure that a woman's womb had been shut. You see, every time there is scarcity in a man's life, in a nation, and he's looking as if something is missing. <laughs> it is because something, God is withholding something to cause something to be battered. The reminder of revival that we are hearing and is looking as if we are not touching it is because the real thing God is about to do is waiting for some people to become like Anna. What their desires will be altered and what they will begin to lay as a demand to God will be nothing about themselves. Because at the beginning, why Anna wanted a child was because she looked at Penina and felt that I should have my own baby. But on that day at Shiloh, she went before God and the need that she presented to God was nothing about herself. She said to God, give me a child and when you give me, immediately I will take that child and I will give it back to you. And God knew that this womb cannot be shut any longer. Listen to me. The day your prayer points change into what God wants to do, answer will come. And so she asked God and the next answer God gave her was what he needed. He needed a fresh vessel. He needed a life that he could sit upon. He needed a tongue that he could still speak the truth. And so, when Samuel was born, Samuel had to be born in the midst of corruption. There's a reason why some of us are seeing the things that we are seeing. God is intentional about allowing you to know about the wrong that is happening around you. Right now, you might not be able to administer change and justice to it, but God wants you to be aware because still you are that breed is choosing to ride upon, to bring upon change upon the land. And so Samuel was born in corruption, yet not corrupted. Samuel was born whereby the only mentors he had were people who slept with women. And yet that was not his testimony. Where he chose to sleep is to sleep by the ark of covenant. Because you see, when God has chosen a man, God will ensure that he is pulled, he is lured towards him. The things of God that are drawing you are intentional. Not everybody is doing what you are doing is for a reason. God is the one calling you. And so Samuel will sit by the hack of God until God began to call his name. And when God called his name, God began to tell him that he was about to do something in Israel that was going to bring about a revival in the land. But guess what happens? 
even in the midst of that, Eli dies. And this is the strange thing that happened in the days of Samuel. After Eli died, all of a sudden for 20 years, the hack of God was taken. And we never heard of Samuel again. Where was Samuel for 20 years? What happened to him for 20 years? Because the next time we saw him appear, he just showed up. There is no man that suddenly appears. Every time God is about to do something that a generation will never forget, he takes them into hiding. And what I want to do as I conclude and give you the prayer point of tonight is to show you where Samuel was for 20 years. The Bible told us about Samuel that he had a circuit in his life. After he came before Israel and pronounced to them that today God was calling them back into repentance and it was time for God to become their king again. The Bible ended the summary of the life of Samuel by saying to us that none of his words fell to the ground. He also told us that Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. In the Bible, people judge Israel for 20 years. People judge Israel for 40 years. But when they got to Samuel, they said Samuel, he started judging Israel from the day he was born till the day he died. What was the circuit? The Bible said this was the circuit of Samuel. Number one, every year he visits Bethel. Number two, he visits Gilgal. Number three, he visits Misfi. I will take it again. Number one, he visits Bethel. Number two, he visits Gilgal. Number three, he visits Misfi. Because of time, I will not be able to explain all of this. But I will touch it. Just read one, one point to you. And then I will trust the Holy Spirit to help you. What is Bethel? Bethel is a place of encounter. Genesis chapter 28, 12 to 18. Everyone who wants to retain the fire of revival in his life must never fail to revisit his place of encounter. His first love. Many people are running on a declining love today. You want to continue to burn for God? Visit Bethel again. It was the place that Jacob had an encounter with the ladder of God. God ascending and descending. Men who sustain revival are always fresh on the altar of love. Number two, what happened at Gilgal? Gilgal was the place where everyone who did not know what God did for the children of Israel was circumcised. Because when people were leaving Israel, some of them were circumcised. But because of the 40 years journey, there were children that were born and many of them were not circumcised. So at Gilgal, God said to Joshua, get a flint stone and begin to circumcise everyone. Who might not have known the covenant? Listen carefully to me. One of the critical things that God wants to do in our days is to begin to use men like stones. Because there will be people who are not aware of the intention of God for such a time as this. And it is God's intention that he will use you as a stone to cut deep. Not to cut to injure, but to cut to repair. So that in the day that God gives you your own child, you will ensure that there is a circumcision and a kind of child that you will bring forth. So that in the day that God takes you to a church, there is a kind of message you, you will bring. God is introducing stones again that can cut. It's not every time that there is celebration, there must be seasons of cutting. And it is only by circumcision that the covenant is renewed. So Samuel always visited the place of circumcision. The place of making. Number three. is called Mispe. 
Genesis chapter 31 verse 49. You can look at Judges chapter 10 verse 17. Judges chapter 11 verse 11. Mispe was a place of vows. It's like a watchtower. There was a man named Jephthah who made a vow unto God in this place. Mispe represents a place of commitment. Many of us need to return back to the days where we made several commitments and vows to God. And again, check how faithful have you been on the covenant that you have made with God. Every time a generation understands how to return to the first place of encounter, our first love, when our heart was burning with God. Every time a generation knows how to return to the place of circumcision and not to be filled with excitement, but go back to the place where God again can break to mend and goes back to the place of checking back those words that you said when you were younger. The commitments that you made, I will follow you before many things began to rise. Every time a generation understands that circuit, it continues to burn. But the moment we forget and we allow the affairs of life to choke us, it's a matter of years. In 20 years time, God will still have to repeat the same sermon again. Because many times what has happened in the body of Christ is that we have not passed patterns. We have restarted races. But I'm trusting God that in the few words that I have said, that God tonight will find someone. That he will use as an example of what he means for a vessel to be revived. And today will become a memorial for you for the rest of your life. Like a burning fire upon your head. That even from today, every single place that God will place you. Every single place that God will send you, he will use you as light. Let your amen be louder than this. Jump on your feet. We're about to pray. And the prayer you want to pray is this. Father, your fire within me will not go out. That's the prayer I want you to pray. In 2012, myself and five boys gathered in UI. My friend had gone for a meeting and then he showed up and said, let's pray for 24 hours. I went for a meeting where they prayed 12 hours for seven days. Let's pray for 24 hours. So we gathered together and we decided to pray. We were five guys and three ladies. The ladies came and then left and they brought us food at the end of the 24 hours. We're going to fast and pray. Mirum. And we began 6 a.m. that morning. And it was going to last till 6 a.m. It was that prayer movement that became the fire of God that began to light in many campuses in Nigeria. It started with five people in a room. That was what became UI Praise in UI. It was from UI praise that some set of people were praying in University of Ife, Obafemi Aulo University. And all of a sudden, the power of God touched the lady and began to scream, God is doing something in UI. It was from Ife that many universities began to have this same praise. Where it started from was five boys who sat in a room and said, let's wait on God for 24 hours. The UI prayers had no leader. They had no time for prayers. They just come to the field of Chapel Tamak. And as they begin to pray, people walk in and join them. And people were praying 9 p.m. till the next morning daily. But you see, it's not the beauty of the prayer that I'm looking for. This is what I want to tell you about many of those movements. They are nowhere to be found. Things die. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But you see, that's not even the one that's paining me. What is paining me 
is that there were five of us. One of them is Evangelist Lawrence. The second was his twin brother. I was the third. The remaining two, one of them was in the University of Ife at that time. The last time I heard of him was he was caught when he stole a phone. And he was beaten till he began to bleed. The fifth. He got married two years ago. Marriage scattered. Work with God emptied. But there were five. What did God want to do with that light he started? That's not how people end. Oh, we are still young. Sometimes we don't determine how a man has run in the middle of the race. Let's give us 30 more years. It's too early to decide that you will be able to share great testimonies about your work with God. Though. Let's wait till you have two children. Let's wait for 10 years. And if you are still on fire, we will know if you caught something with God. Let's wait until there's a choice for marriage. That's why I'm taking you through the circuit of Samuel. What made him last was he never forgot how God started with him. Never forgot how God circumcised him. Never forgot the things he said to God. There are many who started and the revival died. I want you to pray for five minutes. My time is up. Jesus, this fire will not die. I'm starting with you today. I must end with you. Ah, you, you are not praying. Make it louder. When you are praying, you will know. It's five minutes and I will be out of here. Please increase it. Five minutes. Please pray with body. Pray with body. This hunger will not die. This fire will not die. This fire will not die. Jesus, keep me hungry. Jesus, keep me burdened. When your glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh, we are praying for just five minutes, so. And I will drop the mic. Please pray for your life. For when the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh. Hmm. When the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh, four more minutes, pray. Oh. Four more minutes. For when the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh. When the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh, Kai. Jesus, when the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh, keep me hungry, oh. Three more minutes, pray. Satapako Pandeta Hila Bakaya. There's a power 
fire of God that sustains you. There's a fire of God that strengthens. Ask for a fire burning on your altar. Ask for a fire burning on your altar. Open your mouth and pray. Ask for a fire that never runs out, that never goes out, that will be able to face the destructions of the enemy and remain. What we God wants you to give your generation is not an inheritance of material. It is God for a good man. Give it, leave it an inheritance for his children. There's still a journey ahead. Sow a seed into 10 years time. Sow a seed into 15 years time. Sow a seed into 20 years time. I will not be a waste. I will not be a waste of spiritual investment. I will not be a waste, oh God. How can you choose me and I waste? This is only moment when God walks in on us. Every eyes is on the lion and the lamb. For when the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh. For when the glory comes, there'll be no words to say. Oh, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. This is not a prayer that ends here because you know, there's time. Please pray. There are many that God could have used to. Oh, you have not met prophets. You have not met intercessors. So there are many. There are many that have fallen. That's why I like the theme. The revival to remember. Because many have been forgotten. It doesn't take too long to forget that a man came. It doesn't take too long to forget that a man ever showed up. It will look as if God's calling was never on his life. But I decree tonight that whatsoever God has chosen you for, you will fulfill. I decree tonight beyond my words that they become mixed with fire. They remain burning in your heart. That the God that keeps men perpetually on fire for him. That even from this place, it will set you ablaze and keep you burning. I prophesy right now in the name of Jesus. As a token that I came to this house. Let the angels of this anointing. Let the angels that validate God's call upon my life. Standing upon the promise and covenant. The angels of light and alignment. For everyone desirable of light. As I count from one to five. Right now, Holy Spirit. Those who are confused. Those who family are going through crisis. And there is need for clarity. As I count from one to five right now. Let light be introduced to your life now. One, two, three, four, five. In the name of Jesus, let the light of God shine right now. I decree for everyone that requires alignment. The angels of this calling, they align you with God's plan and purposes over your life now in the name of Jesus. I decree for every David that has been waiting for this Samuel. Everyone called to be kings in areas of their life that has been waiting for a Samuel to arrive and anoint you. 
I take my posture as a Samuel called for this purpose. Wherever you are now, I stretch my hand to you. Let that oil that provokes kingship, authority, calling, purpose. Let it rest now. 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 It gets stronger. It gets stronger. It gets stronger. It gets stronger now. It gets stronger. It gets stronger. Every head waiting for this anointing. Touch, 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 touch. That young man, that there is a call on your life to speak. I decree your tongue has been losing. Touch now, touch now, touch now. That's one giving the grace for sight. Touch now, touch now. It gets stronger, it gets stronger, it gets stronger, it gets stronger, it gets stronger. He gets stronger. Help him. Help him. Palatosina Kaba. He gets stronger. Every David in this house. Every Deborah. Everyone that has been waiting for the appearance of this Samuel. I appear in the clock of my prophetic ordination. And I command you. Arise into purpose. There are three people that the hand of God wants to rest upon. West number one, Holy Ghost, touch. West number two, West number three. Let the hand of God rest on you. Let him pull you into his plan and purpose. That from today, everything you need to do part time, he shows you. Everywhere you will become a functionary for his purpose, he aligns you. Every help you need for your calling and ministry. It sends you helpers of destiny that will make it happen. Where others failed. That's my last prayer for you today. Where fathers failed. Where mothers failed. Where sisters failed. Where uncles failed. Where papas failed. When those before you failed, you will not fail. What quenched those before you will not quench you. The grace of God continues to rest upon you. In Jesus' mighty name. Go ahead and jam your hands together for Jesus.